Good afternoon, everybody. So, as um, Phil mentioned, I'm at BBSRC, um, and one of my roles is helping out um, with the GGR Demonstrators Programme. So, um, it's a new programme, um, launched about a year ago, um, and as Lizzie mentioned, it's around a £30 million investment um, funded by the Strategic Priorities Fund. So, the programme really has, um, it has two components. It has um, these five demonstrators, which are investigating five different methods of greenhouse gas removal. Um, these are largely land-based. And then there's the Directorate Hub, which has this overarching coordination role across the programme and um, with the wider GGR community. So I will now move on to the presentations. So first up, we've got um, Chris Evans from the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, and he will talk around the um, peatland restoration demonstrator. So we've got about five minutes, and please don't forget to um, put your questions on the Slido. The number's disappeared now, but hopefully you've all got it by now. Okay, afternoon, everyone. It's a bit dazzling. Um, <laughs> right, uh, I'll, I'll see if I can remember what's on my slides as we go and get the thing to work. Uh, so this morning you heard about, no, that doesn't work. Maybe this one works. Right, um, you heard about things that have been done. This is now stuff that hasn't happened yet. Um, we're a year in, we're getting there, um, but just it'll be mostly what we're trying to do and why. Um, so I think Pete kind of snuck into this programme, uh, to be honest, so I'm, I'm happy it did, obviously. Um, and I'll try and explain why I think it's important and worth doing. Uh, so the first thing is Pete is quite a big part of the UK's greenhouse gas mitigation strategy, but at the moment that's really more to do with avoided emissions. So we, we put Pete into the inventory um, a couple of years ago and immediately turn the land use sector from a net sink to a net source by doing that because those emissions are quite large. Uh, and now there's quite a lot of effort going on to try to make them a bit smaller. But at the moment, it's really about, you know, turning a positive emission into a less positive emission rather than removal. Um, so why peak for GGR? Well, I mean, there's a few things, but one is just this is not necessarily a bad place to put carbon. If you look at that photo, if you can see it, um, you probably can't see the dot, but up there there's a river and it literally is up there <laughs> because that used to be the ground level and the ground levels dropped several metres um, over a period of a 350 years or so at that site. Um, so that's a huge missing carbon store in the landscape. It probably, if you take the numbers for the whole of England, it probably bumped up atmospheric CO2 by about 0.15 ppm off the top of my head. So there's a huge amount of carbon gone. Um, if we could put that carbon back, that would be quite useful. And, and while we're not competing with you know, standard carbon capture and storage, it's another place you might put it. And effectively, you can put, you know, <laughs> it's next to the East Coast main line in the A1. It's, it's not particularly hard to get to. Um, and if you can get it wet and keep it wet, uh, which these systems naturally are, then that carbon is stable, uh, potentially permanent, you know, stable over millennia. Um, yeah, and you can see how much of the sort of land is, is gone as a result of historic drainage. Uh, so the challenges we have, and I'm going to have to read them, so sorry for turning away from you. Um, well, the first one is when you drain a peat, it emits CO2 really fast uh, and at high levels. Um, but when you turn that round or you have a natural system, it sequesters much slower. Uh, so we've got a lot to lose and it's quite hard to get it back. And that's the first thing. Uh, the second challenge is there's a risk that CO2 uptake is going to be cancelled out by methane emissions. And if you look in things like the Royal Society report, it, it refers to that as one of the key reasons why wetland restoration isn't going to get us too far. And that really is a challenge. Um, the, the data there are just showing that trade-off with water table. And the black line there is the kind of balance of the two. So we, just with that black line, sort of natural processes, we can't get very negative. Um, we also have challenges in terms of the sort of socioeconomics and the, and the biodiversity aspects. So Upland peatlands, are, you know, there are our, our kind of rainforest in a way. Uh, the high conservation value, the high amenity value. Um, there's limited scope to sort of muck about with them in a GGR context. Uh, so we need to be careful there. In the lowlands, it's mostly been turned over to agriculture. It's much more freedom to manage differently, but we also need to produce food and not just offshore emissions by producing food elsewhere. So those are the challenges we're looking at. Uh, so those are our three demonstrators. There's one lowland site, which is in North Nottinghamshire, sort of Humberhead area, uh, and then one in the North uh, South Pennines and one in Mid Wales. And they've each got, so it's two upland, but they've got different kind of environmental and social contexts. One is very much kind of old heather moor, large populations around it. The other one is kind of moribund agricultural land. Um, 
these are kind of hard to see, but that's the view from that river I showed you earlier, looking down to the fields where we're doing this work. Um, that's the Heather Moorland in the Pennines, uh, and that's looking down on this area that was subject to essentially failed land improvement. So it's degraded, but not actually productive land, really. Um, so what we're trying to do um, is to move that line downwards, essentially. So this is from the proposal, very much what we want to do. Uh, so we can get so far with natural processes, but to get further, we have to do something about methane. And then effectively, we're thinking about how we can shift the balance in favor of carbon accumulation through either sort of accelerated restoration in upland context or sort of more like active geoengineering type measures in a lowland context. So we're looking at things like farming monocultures that have high biomass productivity, both wetland species and, and bioenergy species, uh, converting biomass to biochar, seeing if that gives us a kind of augmented carbon accumulation. And we're starting at the plot scale and, and those Again, you can't see it too well, but the, this was our lowland site that was planted up last week uh, with a variety of crops. It's currently way too dry, thanks to the weather, so we're trying to get the water up as fast as we can. Uh, and if subject to how that plot scale study goes, we'll, we'll move to field scale. Um, ideally, it'll look like that in a few years, um, but we'll see. And there are three flux towers in three fields there, which is already giving us pretty cool data, actually, just as to what's going on in the current situation. And, once we start to mess with it, we'll, we'll see what effect that has. Uh, breaking the link between CO2 and methane, we've got a few ideas on this. Uh, and there's quite a, a good body of evidence suggesting if you can get sphagnum cover in the uplands, that acts as a kind of methane filter. Um, and a lot of it's been lost from places like or all of it from the Pennines due to air pollution, for example. Uh, we're looking at whether we're getting sulfate into the system which we know from the acid rain days does actually suppress methane, uh, whether we can do that in a sort of controlled way. Uh, basically, the sulfate-reducing bacteria compete with methanogens. Uh, and really through a, a slightly accidental experiment, we, we got some quite nice, well, my colleague Neil McNamara got some nice results, um, suggesting that actually putting biochar onto flooded land might have quite an effective role in suppressing both methane and nitrous oxide. Um, and finally, um, we need to make this economically viable in order for it to be scalable. Uh, so we're working with farming partners and, and others uh, to look for ways to sort of build GGR in a peatland context into the supply chain. And the interest here is in particular in trying to create a food system. So a system which is in incorporating, you know, high water table management, biomass production, GGR with food production, whether that's through indoor farming or, or, or various other options we're, we're working with different farmers. Um, why that didn't come up straight away. Um, and as others have said, we need things like monitoring and verification for this to be adopted at scale. Um, and just as a final comment, this, this is a separate project, but it's, it's aligned to it. It's through the Bayes uh, funding round, phase one, uh, looking at whether actually you could use these areas effectively as repositories for biochar because you can create a saturated system. One good thing about that is it can't catch fire. Uh, another is that the carbon density of that, if, if you just bring the land up to where it used to be, is absolutely eye-wateringly high. Uh, so that's something else we're interested in. So that's me. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Chris. Um, so we'll move on to our next talk, um, which is from another Chris, Chris Pearce from the National Oceanography Centre. Uh, thank you very much. I'm here on behalf of David Beerling and the rest of our consortia to tell you about the work that we're going to be doing looking at greenhouse gas removal with UK agriculture through enhanced rock weathering. Now, as many of you may already be aware, we've been doing, some of us have been doing this work through the Leverhulme Centre for Climate Change and Mitigation for the last five years. And this project really builds on the, the work that we've been doing through that, but bringing the focus back here on the UK and how we can use enhanced rock weathering to meet our net zero targets. And there's actually a recent modelling study came out just a couple of weeks ago uh, indicating that, contrary to some previous estimates, enhanced rock weathering could account for up to 45% of the UK's net zero targets by 2050. So the work we're doing is trying to validate that and assess its viability. Are those modelling estimates actually real? And we're doing that by assessing the scientific viability, the social uh, acceptance, and the scalability potential of enhanced rock weathering in UK agriculture. 
We're doing that They're using three different uh, field tri trials. Uh, in, and land use is our representative of up to 74% of the UK's agricultural use. Specifically, we're using, uh, looking at sites in Plinlimon, uh, which is representative of upland grazing, in North Wyke in Devon, which is uh, lowland grazing, and we're using sites in Harberdon, uh, which is uh, uh, arable crop rotation, and I'll give you some details on each site uh, shortly. At all three locations, we're going to be conducting an array of geochemical, biological, and ecological assessments to really validate both the, the scalability um, potential of enhanced weathering and also its uh, ecological and environmental impacts. Uh, in addition, we're looking at, um, at public uh, uh, perceptions and the relative risk assessments of uh, uh, enhanced rock weathering, looking at the potential barriers to deployment or opportunities and different perspectives of the different land use and st uh, stakeholders. Uh, further, we're looking at sustainability potential using invest and life cycle analysis, some of which we've already heard about through Pete and Phil this morning. And we're looking at process-based modeling, looking at the broad implications of application of enhanced rock weathering, looking at its potential to impact uh, groundwaters and uh, net transfer of alkalinity to the oceans. So moving on now to look at the sites that will be running these trials. Uh, first up is Plinlimon. This is a site operated by CEH and has actually been a, a long-term monitoring site uh, for many decades now in, in North Wales. They've been looking at uh, changes in uh, climate and uh, land use over a long time frame. So it's a great position for us to conduct a monitoring study because we have all that baseline information, although the work we're doing is just outside of that catchment uh, so as not to interfere with, with that pro long-term program. So we'll be using two adjacent, about five hectare catchments, uh, of, onto which one, one catchment will have basalt applied at 20 tonnes per hectare, and the other one will be left untreated. In both cases, we'll be monitoring changes in water chemistry using uh, V-notch weirs, and as you can see, there's an array of uh, different uh, parameters that can be measured at the site throughout the duration of the trial. The second site, North Wyke, uh, is a lowland grass and, uh, grass and site. Again, this is going to be uh, uh, conducted in a very similar way in terms of the parameters we're monitoring. This is unique, and again, it's another long-term monitoring site operated by Rothamsted Research, and it has six uh, fully hydrologically isolated catchments, so they are naturally underlying by an impermeable clay, la clay layer, which is great. And for the purposes of this study, you can just about see in the top right corner there, we've actually laid um, plastic barriers between the catchments so as we can fully collect all the drainage from each plot to monitor any changes in uh, elutant chemistry from, from the yields. At this site, uh, we had the basalt um, laid down just a few weeks ago, uh, shown by the nice drone image, and we're applying basalt at 40 tonnes per hectare. Finally, at Harpenden, another site operated over a long time frame by Rothamsted Research. Uh, here we're running uh, six plots um, on a, in, within one larger uh, three hectare field, which is very flat. This is our, a nice um, a place to test our different uh, crop rotation schemes. We're using, in top to bottom, uh, winter beans, winter wheat, and winter oil seeds, shown there in the middle. And because these are winter rotations, they're winter seedings, we actually applied the basalt there in December last year, as shown in the, the video, again, at a, a rate of 40 tons per hectare. This site is also, uh, because it's nice and flat, it's also a good place to actually monitor the potential uh, 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 leakage through into the underlying water table. Uh, so we've actually uh, installed some bore waters. I should actually emphasize we don't expect any impact on groundwaters to the size of this trial. This is just purely to help our monitoring studies. So we, we're installing lysimeters to look at changes in poor water chemistry, but we do not expect there to be any changes in the groundwater table as a function of this work. Nevertheless, we can use the results coming from this trial to help us modeling what the larger scale implications of a large scale enhanced rock weathering would be. And that's us, uh, our team uh, from Leeds, taking the first measurements of the borehole water chemistry as part of the baselines in the top right. As I mentioned, so part of the work is actually testing the viability and the potential impacts of enhanced rock uh, weathering application. The other half is looking at uh, the perceptions uh, and the potential for upscaling this technique. Uh, so Phil has already mentioned some of the work that's being done in this context. The other half is um, social engagement. So Nick uh, Pigeon and his team in Cardiff are doing a whole lot of uh, assessments looking at uh, public uh, perception, stakeholder perception, land use holders perception to this, and, and how that can be used to, to encourage or what barriers need to be overcome in relation to that work. And key to this is really looking at the 
the historical and cultural context. So there's a, a, an article here in terms, in terms of afforestation. Lots of people get very uh, sensitive when you talk about changing how land is used. You know, the, many of those uh, uh, considerations come into play with enhanced weathering application as well. And again, this builds on some of the policy work we've been doing through the Lever Hume Center already. And finally, as I just alluded to, is the sustainability and upscaling work. So Pete Smith uh, and um, his team in, in Aberdeen are looking at um, life cycle analysis using applying the INVEST uh, LCA model to look at the whole uh, cycle uh, impacts of enhanced rock weathering. And Phil and his team are looking at some of the alternatives to mining uh, basaltic waste and potential to reuse as a, the slag industry and the slag waste and uh, alternative products. And with that, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, so we'll now move on to the biochar demonstrator, and it's Colin Snake from the University of Nottingham. Good afternoon. I'll try and explain our motivation. And we've heard about enhanced rock weathering. We've heard about BECs, and already there is huge potential. And they are all, both those technologies are featuring very strongly in terms of all GGR removal scenarios. Uh, biochar, whichever scenario you look at, the jury is definitely still out. Um, there's a whole load of uh, key deployment barriers which we are addressing in this uh, project. And I think just to put it into context, against the uh, 30 million tonnes of carbon, 100 million tonnes of uh, CO2, uh, equivalent 2050 target, if biochar can only do 1 million tonnes of carbon a year, but clearly it's not making that big, bigger contribution. So first slide lists the uh, academic research partners. We are working with a whole bunch of uh, stakeholders, and I've just grouped those uh, together, uh, biochar producers, uh, stakeholders policy, and many partners involved in our uh, trial uh, program, as well as uh, many international partners. And it's absolutely been great since the uh, grant was announced uh, last May. I think we've uh, increased our number of stakeholders by at least uh, 10. So just to put the uh, project into a uh, nutshell, simplest form as uh, possible, there's uh, four uh, work streams, themes, uh, preparation, characterization, uh, permanence, uh, stability of biochar, uh, the uh, deployment trials, I'll say something about. That naturally leads into techno-economic uh, LCA and, and, and assessment, and uh, fin finally, societal engagement. So, the headline figure for the programme is we're going to deploy uh, 200 tonnes of uh, biochar across uh, various uh, settings. Where is all that biochar coming from? I've uh, just shown you a couple of images. The top one is uh, a pilot facility in uh, Derby, occupied by CEG, which could produce, if it was operating 24-7, of the order of 10,000 tonnes of uh, biochar a year. Um, even though the bottom image looks fairly big, this is just a essentially small pilot scale, rotary kiln. So generally we are producing sub -tub, uh, ton quantities on that. We're working uh, pre pre predominantly on uh, woody uh, biomass, and that is just because of the uh, current uh, regulatory uh, framework. We're introducing residues, or dare I mention the word uh, waste, um, causes uh, issues as the uh, legislation and reg regulatory uh, framework is uh, currently framed. So uh, clearly, uh, there's scope for alternative feedstocks. And, and I think the issue, and a lot will come out of this program, is you know, for woody biomass, there's a whole lot of uh, competition out, out there already. Uh, do, do, do you just sell it for uh, combustion? Uh, when the price of carbon rises a bit, does it go to BEX or does it go to biochar? So we are looking at a range of alternative uh, feedstocks. Um, so a rather inconvenient truth is once you put biochar in the ground, if you're not careful, some of it will degrade over a decadal timescale. So 
the logical argument is you should only be paid for the bar charm that's still going to be there in 100 to 200 years uh, time. And the reason we like uh, hexagons and why we've included a lot of uh, hexagons in our uh, logo is we've got a, a method for measuring what we call the uh, stable polyaromatic uh, carbon fraction in uh, bar char. This is a, a method we've uh, uh, commercialized uh, globally and essentially we can go beyond just a simple measurement such as atomic H over C ratio and convert that directly into what we estimate as the a stable fraction in bar char. We're also using uh, radiocarbon. If we make a uh, bar char from ancient wood, in, in other words, it doesn't contain any so C14, we can then apportion uh, which CO2 emissions are coming from bar char, which ones are coming from the uh, soil natural organic matter. So the uh, deployment uh, program is across uh, arable land, uh, forestry, uh, woodland, uh, temp temporary uh, grassland. We've got the order of 15 tonnes of bar char in the ground already. Um, some of those trials are at our uh, un university farm at uh, Sutton Bonington. Uh, some of those are in, in conjunction with the uh, National Forest. And we're currently recruiting uh, farmers for the big push in deployment, which will be uh, late summer uh, autumn, where we're aiming for uh, 100 tonnes. And, and clearly, the rationale is if you are looking at uh, agricultural land, uh, bar chart deployment is not going to take off un 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 unless you've got the uh, farming community 100% on board. And on that theme, it's very important in uh, the short term to demonstrate all the wonderful core benefits you can get uh, from bar char. Um, instead of bar char, just think ac activated uh, carbon. Bar char is essentially low cost ac activated carbon and ob obviously has fairly high absorption capacity, so can pr prevent uh, runoff, can reduce greenhouse gases from uh, co core composting, uh, chuck, chuck it into anaerobic digestion, you can't actually uh, increase. Uh, Methane, yeah. so it is uh, very important uh, to convey all these uh, core benefits to the uh, farming community. Um, why the figures at the top? Uh, wisdom is for temperate grassland uh, forestry, you can really push it uh, a lot further than with uh, arable land. With arable land, we're going to be monitoring uh, e ecosystem services. Clearly, once you might get benefits, um, the guiding principle is caution uh, to avoid uh, any negative effects in terms of crop yields, ecosystem services. And yeah, te 10 tonnes per hectare is round about, shall we say, a safe limit. But uh, going back to my original point, if you extrapolate that to six, six million tonnes of, uh, six million hectares, sorry, of uh, arable land, that only equates to something like 40 million tonnes of carbon, which is only equivalent to uh, one year of the uh, 2050 uh, target. So um, integrated techno-economic life cycle uh, analysis, we've just filled the appointments uh, recently, but just to give you an example of the approach, this is from a, a base phase one project, and economically, this does represent, shall we say, the low hanging fruit in terms of uh, production costs, uh, which are clearly dependent on uh, the price of carbon feedstock costs. So we are literally taking the residue from uh, food anaer anaerobic digestion, which is going to increase by a factor of two or three between now and uh, 2030. And essentially, what we're doing is converting that into a uh, bar char. And the reason this is a low hanging fruit and uh, the important number on the graph are um, the uh, diamonds, which just represent several different scenarios. But the bottom line is we're coming out at a cost around about uh, 100 pound per tonne of CO2 avoided. And the reason we're getting so low in this particular case is because of the uh, gate fee uh, in terms of the uh, water industry's paying, paying an arm and a leg uh, for it to go to uh, in incineration. So final but uh, certainly not the least important part of the programme is uh, societal engagement, social science. Um, there's essentially dearth in the literature on stakeholder societal engagement r regarding biochar. So our social science team, Caroline Price, Caroline 
Carol Morris have already set up an extensive uh, ex exercise involving uh, all our uh, stakeholders and 30 interviews are already planned. And the good thing about the field trials, this really gives us a route into local agricultural uh, com com communities uh, in terms of uh, recruiting uh, people to uh, interview. So that's really the program in a nutshell. And just to finish on, um, the most important people on this project uh, is, is, is certainly not me. It's the uh, early career uh, researchers and lucky to have uh, five of them in, in the audience. And I think we're all sitting together, uh, third row uh, from the back. So just to uh, go through everybody, uh, Clement Aguna, who's really con concentrating on uh, bar char st stability. Uh, Maria Mica, Rob Brown, both from uh, Bangor, uh, involved in uh, grassland trials and also some of the other agricultural trials. Uh, Genevieve uh, Hutchins is the uh, centre manager. And uh, Disney Gamarara Alagi, uh, if I pronounce that right, uh, Disney because uh, I, I only tried it for the first time on the train coming down this morning, uh, is, is, is our uh, LCA uh, expert. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Colin. So next we'll move on to um, Woodland Creation and Management, um, and that's um, Ian Bateman from the University of Exeter. Oh, and I should say, don't forget to add your questions to the Sligo, please. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, it's, uh, it's great to be able to uh, 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 present the uh, Net Zero Plus uh, project to you. As you can see, it's a, uh, a collaboration across a whole range of uh, different institutions, in particular uh, University of Aberdeen, University of Exeter, Forestry Research and the National Trust. So I want to introduce the demonstrators through two points. Um, and the first of these is to just give you a feel for the uh, strategic objectives of Net Zero Plus and in particular its policy relevance. It addresses um, the complexity of real-world land use change. So we're trying to get away from the uh, single issue decision-making that has dominated, uh, well, at very least the last 50 to 60 years. So instead of just saying we've got a problem such as food, so let's just use land for food and nothing else, uh, we don't want to repeat that uh, mistake. Yes, addressing this huge increase in uh, carbon emissions is something that the programme has to do, but we also have to recognise that there are other problems going on, such as the uh, um, destruction of uh, biodiversity, uh, both uh, in this country and globally, and also all the other effects that happen every time that you change the uh, land use system, the impacts that it has on the environment and the economy and their interactions. Now, this is a complex challenge, and often uh, the uh, conventional approach to that is just to propose a simple solution. So let's plant a load of trees. Um, it's actually not quite as simple as that because of the fact that you're changing a system. You're changing an environmental economic system. So Net Zero Plus attempts to be real world and look at that complexity. And the first thing that we have to recognise is that, sadly, uh, we don't get to just dictate what land use is. Uh, land uh, in this country uh, and generally around the world is privately owned. And uh, we have to actually incentivise change. And in some places, that's uh, pretty easy to do. In other places, it's extremely costly and may well not be uh, worthwhile. So we have to bring in that real-world complexity right from the start. Once we've done that, we can eliminate a load of you know, scientific, hypothetical um, uh, lack of reality and focus on what is actually feasible within future land uses. Nevertheless, there's still a lot. There's a lot that we can do here. But 
recognizing what is feasible and also recognizing the fact that if we do different things in different places, we can do an awful lot better than if we just take a sort of uh, flat rate approach to the entire world and just say, right, we're going to try and do uh, the same thing everywhere. Recognizing that, of course, in terms of uh, choosing the right locations, choosing the right tree species, for example, uh, recognizing that they have different relationships with greenhouse gas uh, removal, sometimes very fast, sometimes very slow, but also those relationships can result in a lot of very different products down the line. So, in a way, there's, there's, you've got to be really careful of uh, knee-jerk reactions that just say, right, we're going to um, plant a load of extremely fast-growing trees because that will take a lot of carbon out of the atmosphere. If then you find that you're end, uh, ending up with a load of very short lifetime products after that, if all you're doing is really producing the cardboard boxes uh, of tomorrow, then that carbon's going to be out in the atmosphere again pretty quickly. So we have to think about what the real net greenhouse gas uh, consequences of uh, land use change will be. And there is some, some complexity here that we cannot ignore. So if we're planting on land, for example, that is uh, currently used for uh, producing food, then we have to, in our, our analysis, take into, a, the, into account the possibility that that might lead to us uh, bringing in food uh, to the country from, from, uh, from different countries. That in itself is not a problem, but it's a huge problem if that food, for example, is produced by chopping down tropical rainforests. All we're doing then is planting trees here to make ethanol feel good, but actually contributing to a global warming uh, down the line. Next thing we have to uh, think about, at least we would if this thing worked. Uh, sorry, not, oh, there it is, okay. Um, is that uh, it's, as I said, not all just about carbon. So, uh, changing land use such as uh, growing uh, uh, new trees will affect things like biodiversity, but it will also affect uh, the water environment, water quantities, water qualities, uh, flooding. Uh, it will maybe affect the potential to produce food in different environments. So what is the possibility of actually planting trees on the land so that we can boost our production of food in the coastal zone by cleaning up rivers, reducing uh, marine pollution, uh, and uh, generating different forms of protein. Now, this looks complicated, but we're actually looking here at the minimum set of things that you need to look at so that you don't make the mistakes of the past. And we have made hor horrendous mistakes in the past. So, this go, is going to need to be incorporated into some sort of decision support system, and that's a central output. We are delivering this through a set of uh, work streams, uh, and uh, this includes new uh, research out on the ground, actually measuring carbon, but also new modelling, uh, taking into account that carbon leakage, taking into account all the other effects, biodiversity, so on, and also integrating uh, decision maker and other stakeholder inputs into the creation of decision support systems. It's being uh, conducted by an absolutely fabulous set of uh, colleagues, and uh, it's great to, to know that uh, many of them are in the audience today. And we also have um, a very active set of partners from both uh, government and the private sector uh, allowing us to see how different uh, partners have different needs uh, from research. If you're interested, find out more, please do contact us. Uh, we'll be looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Uh, so we're on to our last demonstrator. So the per perennial biomass crops demonstrator and um, presenting is Dr. Jeanette Whitaker. So good afternoon. Um, the perennial
Groups for GGR project is a consortium project led by Ian Donison at the University of Aberystwyth with partners the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, Aberdeen, Rothamsted Research and the uh, Countryside and Community Research Institute at Gloucester. Our project aims to demonstrate the role that perennial biomass can play in contributing to the UK's net zero carbon objectives. And uh, we are addressing the technical and social barriers to the scale up of perennial biomass crops, whilst also trying to demonstrate how we can maximise the greenhouse gas removal potential and also the uh, environmental and social benefits that can accrue. Currently, we plant a few hundred <coughs> hectares per year of perennial biomass crops in this country, and the CCC recommendations would depend on 23,000 hectares per year of perennial biomass crops being planted. And so what can we do to make sure that that happens in a sustainable way and provides that pathway? And so the objectives on the screen are the ones that we're working to across five work packages. And today, because I've only got a few minutes, I'm just going to give you a whistle-stop tour through the work um, that we're planning and what we've done with the last 12 months, so some holiday snaps of what we've been up to. So work package one is about optimising the agronomy. We know for biomass crops that getting the establishment right makes a massive difference to the long-term yield of the crops. So getting the ground preparation and establishment good can give you that yield for the long term. And so at two sites, in the east and the west of England, on grassland and arable, we've been planting large-scale plot trials. Uh, the pictures show some of the activities. So we've been designing, mapping, digging holes, crawling around on the ground, planting these large trials uh, with different agronomies. So um, no-till, strip-till, um, no glyphosate, adding biochar to see how that affects the productivity, but also uh, the soil health, the greenhouse gas emissions, the nitrous oxide emissions. Also at both of these sites, we're doing planting date trials for willow because extending the planting date that you can plant willow at will extend the capacity to plant. At the moment, there are only a limited number of contractors in the UK, and if they can plant over a greater time frame, that means they can get around more places. And that's what we've made. So we've got two of these trials, one at Bishop Burton College in the east and one at Myers Co College in the west on grassland, and we'll be monitoring these over the next three, three and a half years. Work package two is the field scale demonstration. So here at the same two sites, we're planting miscanthus onto arable in the east and willow onto grassland in the west. And these are paired site comparisons. So we've got flux, type, flux towers in the grassland and the willow and the two land uses also in the east. And this is to compare the overall carbon balance of these sites. And the flux towers were installed last summer so that we can measure the CO2 emissions right through the ground preparation, the establishment and the growth of those crops. And again, lots of growing plug plants, uh, planting in the field, less crawling around in the soil because this is all automated and we're getting nice data streams from the flux towers already. And that's what a field of miscanthus looks like and you can see right at the top of the slide, the flux tower on the left in the miscanthus, which is covered in maize, uh, covered in film uh, to cover up the uh, plug plants when they first are planted. And then on the far, in the far distance, the flux tower in the winter wheat at the side. Um, work page three, I haven't got a slide, but that is to really reduce the uncertainty or else soil carbon stock change, um, particularly focused on grasslands. Um, a few years ago, we did a project called the Ecosystem Land Use Modelling Project with a number of people in the audience. And grasslands is one area where we know we need better data because grasslands themselves are such a diverse land use. And so there we're going through a survey to go back uh, to some sites to repeat sample and finding new sites to increase our data set. Work package four is where we uh, get the people involved. So here we've got colleagues at Gloucester, um, social scientists who are going out to the community, both in biomass growing catchments and in catchments where biomass isn't grown yet, to understand the barriers to planting, the enablers, and using things like visualization tools. So this image at the bottom is a landscape visualization tool that can be placed onto a participant's head with a virtual reality headset, and they can walk around a plantation. They can see what it will look like, both kind of from a footpath, but also in the landscape from height. 
And so these kind of the tools that we're playing with and using to really understand people's reactions and negative and positive perceptions. Finally, Work Package 5, led by Ashley Hastings, is bringing it all together. So taking the data from the work packages to improve biogeochemical models and crop growth models, um, and also using information on the ecosystem services, the biodiversity, and the perception work. This aims to estimate biomass crop yield and the GGR potential at one kilometre scale um, across the UK, um, using climate data sets right through to 2100, and also integrating the ecosystem service risks and benefits, um, and finally developing um, a spatially explicit LCA model to show how biomass crops integrate with BECs. So that's kind of whistle-stop tour of our project. Um, we're looking forward to, to the next three and a half years of producing the data and also working with the hub and the other GGR demonstrators to, uh, to deliver the evidence that we need. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeanette. Um, and finally, we're going to hear from um, Cameron Hepburn for the University of Oxford, who's going to talk about the hub. Thank you, Jen. And well done chairing and keeping us all to time. Um, I have to say it's a great pleasure to be in a space with people. And such a magnificent space too. So um, thank you to the team who organised uh, the events today and tomorrow. And I think to uh, UKRI and, and Steve and Phil for having the insight that actually putting these two events together uh, would make it significantly more enjoyable than trying to have them separately. So I'm here to, I'm Cameron Hepburn from Oxford here to talk to you about the hub and our role sitting uh, in a sense in the middle. Um, we're here, obviously all of us are here, because we know that we're in a space, whether you like it or not, uh, we're going to have to take a lot of CO2 and greenhouse gas out of the air. And there's a sense in which there's a, there's a large number of external people who would prefer this weren't the case. We should just be reducing our emissions as fast as possible, and of course we should. Uh, and that is the first order of the day, but we are going to have to take CO2 out of the air and other greenhouse gases, and nice to hear about methane earlier, out of the air at scale. And so this requires the establishment of a pretty big new industry in a pretty short time scale. And that's what this whole program is about with the five demonstrators, the couple of dozen pilots, and the other things that the UK government has going on here. Because even just within the UK, as we've heard already this morning, we're going to have to have a doubling of the land-based reductions uh, and removals and, um, and an increase up to 100 million tonnes roughly per annum. So that's the, the, the context. The, the core hub is, um, you know, in a sense, has the fun job of looking over the, over the five programs you've just heard of to try and extract the, the integrative lessons to help coordinate, to put on events like this, to bring people together, and to do the research that cuts across and is useful to all of these programs. So whether it's thinking about the policy, the economics, the financial case, the MRV questions, how do you evaluate a greenhouse gas removal, where should, where should I be investing my money, what, what sort of offsets should I be buying, these sorts of questions that cut across the individual demonstrators kind of fall within our remit to, to try to sort through. We've got a really uh, amazing team. I think that's, um, I mean, uh, I hope you won't mind me being uh, thrilled by them. Uh, many of them are here, so I can see Elisa up the back. I can see Rob over there, Isabella there, <laughs> Stuart, Steve, etc. cetera. Uh, and between this group of people, we've got most of, if not all of the disciplines I think are necessary. It's a, I mean, intensely interdisciplinary effort. And you know, we've, we've necessarily had to go to all the way up to Edinburgh uh, to get what we needed. Uh, Manchester, Leeds, Bristol, and of, of London and Oxford as well. So it's a great team. Um, as I say, we're kind of integrating uh, and seeking to support the demonstrators with the pieces of analysis and research and thinking that kind of, you know, it doesn't make sense for them to duplicate five times because they cut across the whole story. As we've heard, this is part of you know, just over 30 million pounds of investment from the UKRI's Strategic Priorities Fund, which is seen in a bigger context of the UK and a number of other nations 
realizing that this is both necessary for the climate, but also quite a big economic opportunity. And we'll hear tomorrow uh, from the States, uh, not quite direct from the White House, uh, but almost, uh, from Germany. And we'll also be hearing from uh, the investor community as well, as we think about taking you know, what has been an area of research which is exciting within uh, academic quadrangles, perhaps, but perhaps which the public and the world's financial institutions hasn't quite yet got on top of. And you know, they need to get on top of this space so that we can scale it up in a way that, that works for the public, that works for policy and works for investors as well. Um, this is my last slide. I just want to take you through briefly uh, what it is we will be doing or have already started doing. We started from the perspective that to get from where we are now, which is this being a really interesting area, but which doesn't have the global scale required to where we need to be, we need clarity around the strategic vision of where we're going. This is quite a complex area. You just heard Ian make that point. Um, it's difficult to get clarity about what's going to work and why and how and where, and there's a huge amount of confusion out there in the public domain. So clarity on the strategy. Whatever we need to do needs to be socially robust. So you can have the best science and you can have worked out the most elegant way of taking CO2 out of the air, but if the public get the wrong idea, if they don't like it, um, and publics around the world don't like it, then it's not going to happen. So we have to make sure that we get buy-in from the wider community. Another big challenge is that this is currently, in some, some of these pathways, are, are expensive. And you know, economics, sadly, is what it is. People will do things when they're cheap. So a, a cross-cutting objective here is to bring the costs down. In order to do that, in, in, and in order to deploy uh, these changes in thinking, uh, practices, technologies, and pathways, we need to be changing the way our policy looks, our governance, and our incentives look. So that's a key piece. But so too is making sure that what people think they're buying is what they're getting. And we saw questions in the slide, I'm sure there'll be more, about the MRV piece. That's a key bit here, as is helping people make decisions. And we have an evaluation framework, Isabella's leading on, that will be coming. Uh, so after our five years, what we hope to have delivered with leads from Elisa and Rob and Emily on the, on the communication side and, and the socially robust, uh, robustness side with leads from Richard Templer and Paul Rouse, I think is here too, there he is, Paul, uh, from Imperial, cleverly using a flexible fund to make sure that we, uh, we're filling gaps in this landscape for the country as a whole, um, that we're getting the governance policies and business models in place, Navraj from Edinburgh, Steve, Paul from Manchester, Aoife, uh, Sanya from Oxford are all working on that side of things to make sure this makes financial and economic sense. Joe House, who you heard earlier, I'm not quite as disembodied and godlike as Pete Smith was. For them. That was an absolute highlight, I'm afraid to say, Pete, having you reigning above us, uh, bearded and benevolent. Uh, so Joe will be helping us on the MRV side and, and Isabella and Stuart and others uh, making sure that we've got these decision support tools in place. So look, that's it from me. If you see a hub person around, please do say hello. We're here to help. Uh, and thank you very much. Thanks, Jen. Um, could I invite the rest of the speakers to the stage and we'll have a, a kind of 15, 10 to 15 minute Q&A. Thank you. Um, so I guess we'll start with one of the that more kind of general questions for all of you. Um, so to what extent are the projects considering future climate change impacts on their GGR methods? So, who wants to start? Yeah, I'm happy to give it a go. Um, I'll probably get this marginally wrong and there'll be people in the team that will be holding their head. But um, we're very keen to get away from just thinking about discrete uh, uh, climate scenarios. Um, and uh, definitely uh, not keen to go down the route where you pick a scenario or even pick two scenarios. 
Um, instead, what we're trying to move uh, towards is an approach where you recognize that the future is um, uncertain. Uh, there, are, um, there are a number of possibilities out there. They involve uh, not just changes in terms of emissions and that sort of stuff, but in particular for uh, the impact upon land, uh, changes, of course, in uh, temperatures and precipitation and that sort of stuff. So we're trying to um, bring uh, that future variation into the um, decision support tool uh, so that you can look at uh, really quite a, a broad uh, set of, of futures uh, and not just uh, trap yourself into one or two uh, scenarios. Yeah, something we're doing in collaboration with our GGRD program through the Levy Hume Centre is actually conducting face or free air CO2 enrichment trials where we can actually look at the impacts of elevated atmospheric CO2 on the rate of enhanced rock weathering in a variety of different crop types. So that's been conducted with our collaborators in Illinois, which relates to one of the other questions. So it's very much an international collaborative effort to look at the future scenarios for enhanced rock weathering as a greenhouse gas reduction tool. And Jeanette. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, in the field scale work, we can't test climate scenarios with uh, crops that grow three or four metres tall. Um, but in the modelling work that Astley and Anita Shepherd are doing at uh, Aberdeen, definitely the scenario modelling is looking through and using climate data sets, as I said, that go through to 2100. So in terms of predicting the GGR potential and the yields of these crops across the UK, that is definitely taken into account as climate scenarios. Um, yeah, no, I mean, we're not, we're, we're not going to sort of actively consider climate change impacts, but I think in a peatland context, it's a bit of an easy win because a knack of peatland is in no way climate resilient. Uh, it'll lose more carbon as it gets warmer and drier, whereas a wet peatland is much more resilient. So anything we can do to move existing existence back in, in, onto that kind of stable sort of situation, then I think, I think it's going to sort of, well, there's co-benefits in a way for climate of, of not trashing these systems further. So the way we're thinking is, is to sort of build on what's already happening in terms of restoration, but then try and get a sort of boost in terms of the carbon on top of that. Okay, thank you. So I'll move on to a, another question. So um, a few rich land uh, landowners own a lot of land in many countries, including the UK. Should we really incentivise them rather than <laughs> tell them what to do? <laughs> Ooh. Yep. Yep. Um, <laughs> I think uh, you maybe overestimate my pay grade. Um, <laughs> uh, there's very few people in the country that can actually uh, change things as radically as, uh, as you want uh, there. Uh, I, I, I might, as an, uh, as, a, as an individual, have great sympathy for what you're saying there, but um, I think <laughs> it's very, very important that we stick within uh, the parameters of the world as it is and as it is likely to be in the future. And while uh, we know there's going to be radical change in terms of things like uh, obviously climate, massive change in things that we've got much less certainty about, such as food prices, that sort of thing, um, I, I'm not, I just don't see that as a particularly likely one uh, to happen. If it did, uh, you can still uh, deal with this uh, inside the sort of decision systems that we're all uh, looking at. That would make things loads easier, but I don't think it's going to happen. Can I just pick that one up? Because I think what's behind the question is quite a legitimate concern for equity and inclusion as this plays out. Uh, we're seeing a major kind of rewiring of the economy to get to net zero and to take greenhouse gases out of the air and, and put them on land involves big changes in you know, how, how land is used, who, who gets what effectively. And I think it is very important that we have you know, at least one eye, if not both eyes, firmly on the consequences for equity and fairness of, of these technologies as they scale up. And then I mean, the other thing underlying the question is that sometimes it isn't sensible to use economic tools. I'm an economist, but uh, you know, sometimes actually it can make a lot of sense to tell people what to do. Uh, not always, especially not in a uh, free society and in a democracy. It, um, it can be, <laughs> you, you, you're better off uh, making sure people understand where you're going and using um, instruments and policy tools accordingly. Now, I think, I'm not giving a direct answer to the question, but what does certainly have to change is that the 
different payoffs from the uses of land need to look different in the future to the how, how they currently look so that we're not using land in, um, in, in perhaps let me say inefficient way uh, that we're using it at the moment. Ian and, and actually many of the demonstrators are looking at how they can work together to, to make sure that we're getting multiple benefits for multiple people from the same acre of land. I think that's, that's where we need to go here. So, so underlying the question is a really important point, I think. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think there clearly is a place for regulation and, and stopping people doing bad things. I also, without wishing to comment on the social justice aspect of this, I think, you know, larger landowners and companies are in a position to take risks that perhaps small landowners and smaller organisations can't. So I think there's a place for, for talking to those people because they may be able to adopt practices. And, and to be honest, I think they're kind of queuing up, looking some of them at least for, for well, they've seen the pound signs ultimately. I think the sensitivity, and we talked about this on a call the other day, is the risk that every large you know, multinational and UK company is now looking to buy land, whether it's in the UK or elsewhere, for GGR, for their own insetting, and the, and the cultural impacts of that on rural communities. Like, you know, I live in Wales, and same in Scotland, same in you know, many areas, that there's a lot of sensitivity there, and I think we're quite mindful of that, what, you know, where that might lead and where that might cause a backlash against you know, trying to do some of this stuff. Sorry, I know we covered this a lot, but just to pick up a point raised by Cameron, I think we need to better understand through these projects the self incentivization of the techniques themselves. So, for example, enhanced rock weathering can actually alleviate the need for fertilizers, it can alleviate the need for pH regulation control in acidic soils. So, there can be self benefits from applying these techniques with CO2 sequestration, essentially the, the side benefit, the co benefit. So, we need to better understand those co benefits in a GGR context which could actually perhaps drive the uptake of these technologies in the future. And that's part of the aims of these trials. Okay. Oh, go on. Quickly. Yeah, so <laughs> just to re reiterate the last point, yeah, core co co benefits are key, but uh, I suppose, um, shall we say, looking to the small farmers, perhaps not have nuts, they are clearly going to be incentivised, in, in if I call it Paul, Paul Wilson, here's a form. Your con Congress would spell, it up, spell this out much better than uh, I can, but we're all aware that farmers are operating under extremely, extremely tight margins, so clearly the whole incentive of payment needs to cover, as it, as it were, the whole chain of supplying whatever technology is. Great, so just moving on to a, a few more specific questions for Jeanette. Um, can you comment on the appetite in the farming community for perennial energy crops and how this can be managed alongside annual farming? Yeah, I mean, um, we've been working with stakeholders for about 10 or 15 years and uh, in the agricultural communities and there are definitely areas where bioenergy crops or biomass crops are known, perennial biomass crops, and more widely grown around particular sources such as Drax Power Station, uh, where there was extensive miscanthus planting in Cumbria. Um, Willow is grown for uh, Igerson, for a paperboard manufacturer, and where farmers see neighbours growing it and they talk and in the field about those experiences and hear positive stories. That's how it spreads locally. Clearly what we're talking about is a much bigger scale up than that kind of incremental change. And so what we're trying to understand in the demonstrator is how do we um, in, not incentivize that, but how do we understand what those barriers are and enable us to increase the planting rates at a much higher level? But certainly we get very positive stories generally from uh, farmers when we talk to them about um, biodiversity benefits, you know, being able to put them on by the side of a river where uh, land's flooded and the you know, willow can cope with that. You know, these multifunctional benefits are definitely valued by farmers. And also maybe farmers later in life who want to lower maintenance crop, things like that. So there's a whole load of different reasons why people would take them on. But, um, but yeah, um, in areas where they're grown, there's positive stories. In areas where they aren't grown, there's maybe just a real lack of knowledge. Um, and that's also something we're trying to address. So we've probably just got time for one question. So this one's for Cameron. Given the scale the new GGR industry needs to meet, how do we keep incentivizing growth while ensuring the industry is built on a solid scientific basis? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, m one of my concerns, uh, actually, this is a broader concern with the offset market, is that as the kind of 
companies wake up, they've all got their net zero strategies, they all want offsets, the capital starts flooding into the space. You, you can push this too hard, too fast, too early, because if it grows before it has the firm scientific foundations, you then find you've been paying for you know, practices or offsets that haven't delivered what you thought they were. And then it's very easy to do a story, to build a narrative that it's all greenwash, it's all rubbish, um, and the whole kind of edifice collapses. So it's a really important question. Um, I think programs like this one really help, actually, to do the underlying science. It's not, it's not too early for us to be doing this right now. It's great that we were building on um, the, the program A that Phil has led with this program D that we're in now. But I think you know, the world has kind of woken up uh, post, well, it's been building since the Paris COP, but at Glasgow with 130 trillion US dollars in GFANS uh, being directed to getting to net zero. It's a, ri it's a risk, actually. Uh, and so we need programs like this one. We need to work collaboratively with those in Switzerland, in Germany, in the, in the States, in other countries that are also leading so that we can build out a proper evaluation framework, a proper MRV set of tools so that you know, companies know what they're getting and the whole industry doesn't collapse before it's even born. Thank you very much. So we're just going to wrap up this session now. So we'd just like to thank all the speakers again.